On the heels of last week's Plant Strong podcast, I want to share with you a very personal story that really has to do with getting outside our comfort zones and for a short while putting aside the Sunday morning pancake breakfast. I've been swimming my my whole life. In fact, I can't go more than a couple days without getting in the pool. And I started swimming when I was probably, let's see, seven or eight years old. I, I started getting fairly good in high school and I got good enough to where I was offered an athletic scholarship to the University of Texas at Austin, where I went to school from 1982 to 1986. I was a three-time All-American. I went to the Olympic trials in 1984. And after graduating from University of Texas, I decided to immediately start a career as a professional triathlete. And uh, I did that uh, for 10 years. And then I continued to compete at a world-class level in triathlons for almost another seven years as a firefighter until my my mid-40s. I became really one of the premier open water swimmers in the sport and have never stopped. And, and since I stepped down from, from doing triathlons, I joined a master swim program that I swim at at least five mornings a week. And what happened is uh, about six weeks ago, one of the guys, he challenged me to get the world record in the men's 200 meter backstroke, age 55 to 59 age group. And he said, Rip, there's a swim meet here in Austin in two weeks, I think you should go and I think you should try and get it. And so he planted the seed and, you know, I would wake up in the morning and I'd be thinking about that record and I'd go to bed at night and I'd be thinking about that record. And in swim practices, I started doing a little bit more backstroke and I went to the meet and I missed the record by 1.9 seconds. And I realized that I had not given the record the respect that it deserved. But the good news is I realized that I wasn't that efficient in the water. I got tired on the last 50 meters pretty badly. And and if I wanted to get this record, I had to train in a 50 meter pool. The pool that I've been training in for my master's swim program is a 25 yard pool. And in order to get a world record, it has to be set in a 50 meter pool. It's the same distance that the Olympics are swimming where Michael Phelps won all of his Olympic gold medals. And so I found a pool in Austin that is 50 meters. And for two weeks I trained, I went to eight different morning workouts and trained in this 50 meter pool to really develop my a much longer, more efficient backstroke. And I did a lot more race pace uh, interval work and I did a lot more backstroke. I found a meet that was in Texas, in Houston, Texas. Uh, it was just this last Sunday. And I ended up driving there with my son. And we spent the night, we woke up, you know, I kind of put on my game face and decided that, you know what, it's, it's now or never. You know, tomorrow you're going on a two week vacation. And if you don't, you don't get it today, it's not gonna happen in 2019. So I went out, the gun went off, and I felt good going out, but also relaxed. I was out slower than I wanted. I was out in a 111.4, and I wanted to be out in a 108 or 109. But I brought it back like nobody's business. I brought it back in a 110.3. I negative split it, and I broke the world record by one second. And I felt so relieved and so happy and so psyched because I had put this big, scary, you know, intimidating goal out there in front of me and I was able to conquer it. And, you know, my advice to you is, you know, put something out there in front of you. And if you want to share it with a couple people for accountability reasons, and whether you win, whether you lose, whether you draw, you will not regret it and will make your life that much more rich and fulfilling. Thanks so much for listening to my story. Keep it real. Peace, Engine 2, Plan Strong. Support for today's episode is brought to you by the Nutra Milk. I know that kitchen counter space is prime real estate. And in order for an appliance to make the cut in any house, it has to be 
super useful, not just a dust collector that rarely gets plugged in or hides away in a cupboard. I can share that since adding the Nutramilk to our kitchen, we have taken an immense amount of joy in making and creating our own oat milk from scratch. I love plant-based milks, but our family had a serious oat milk habit that was costing us over $150 a month. Now we make our own in the blink of an eye, and it has made my Rips Big Bowl cereal, something that I've eaten every day for the last 30 years for breakfast, even better. Believe me, your kitchen counter will be glad you made room for this blender. Visit thenutramilk.com and use the code PLANTSTRONG for a $50 discount and free shipping. One of the things that I hear from people, especially those who are brand spanking new to eating plant-based, is that they don't even have a clue where to start when it comes to making really tasty plant strong foods and I totally get it I mean if you're like so many people that we work with at engine 2 you probably have been eating the standard American diet for decades you know your favorite recipes by heart your pantry is probably stocked with ingredients that you are super comfortable with you can meal plan for your family for the week without even taking a shopping list to the grocery store and now you're making this huge change, but it's more than just what you eat. You have to almost relearn a new way to shop and develop flavor profiles to make delicious dishes that are not only gonna nourish your family, but also even convert a visiting carnivore friend from time to time. I want you to know I got you covered. Developing plant-strong foods that are spectacularly delicious is a vital part of thriving in this plant strong lifestyle. If you feel like going plant strong is going to be a diet of deprivation, you are setting yourself up for failure and you are 100% wrong. I want you to know this is truly a diet of abundance. Your mindset needs to be that you are going to be eating these new amazing foods and not on focusing on what is being taken off your plate. Now, the foundation of cooking has always been creating a balance of flavors using salt, sugar, fat, and acid. And guess what? It still is going to be the case. But you can use healthy fats, for example, that come from plants and seeds, right? Instead of using any animal products or any, any animal byproducts. We are going to teach you how. Creating amazing food is such an important part of this lifestyle that I'm devoting the next two episodes to giving you practical tips, recipes, cooking techniques, and some really fun stories from one of the most sophisticated chefs in the plant-based movement, Chad Sarnow. I've known Chad since 2008, which was right around the time we were both brought into Whole Foods to be part of their healthy eating program. Chad served as Whole Foods head global culinary chef, along with a number of other big time roles before he left about five years ago. And since that time, Chad has authored three highly successful cookbooks. He launched the Wicked Healthy brand with his older brother, Derek, as well as Good Catch Foods and Wicked Kitchen. And because <laughs> he doesn't seem to get tired, he also launched the first plant-based certification program for the largest online culinary school called Ruby. Chad is an absolute superstar in the plant-based culinary world. Now, maybe you've been tuning into the Plant Strong podcast when you're out on a run or when you're driving or maybe even biking. But on this one, I think you're going to want to be sitting down with a pen and paper in hand because Chad is about to unleash an absolute torrent of useful information to help you develop plant-strong flavors using some simple recipe techniques for sauces, for soups, and for building uh, layers and layers of flavor. 
along the way. He'll also answer some of Joe Inga's burning questions related to recipes that he's been making for his family. And we're also going to talk about what dinner was like when he was recently flown to cook a mega plant strong dinner for the Terminator, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and a slew of his pals before the Golden Globe Awards. Welcome, my friends. This is Plant Strong. I want to dive into just some kind of practical tips that we can give listeners that are starting to get into plant-based. But before I do, I want to ask you two questions. Yeah. First question is, how long have you been a chef? I have been cooking my whole life. It took me years of cooking and of working in kitchens and eventually running kitchens. Even when I was consulting with kitchens, it was hard for myself to call me. Call me a, it was hard yeah. for me to call myself a chef because it's such a grand title. I think I, uh-huh. I look at you know, um, and it really was a number of years of actually running kitchens that I was okay with that 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 title. Uh, humbly okay with it, right? So, I would say I've been in kitchens my whole life. I mean, since I was probably it was my first job so i mean well, how since old i was 15, 15 14 you know 14 i was washing dishes so we're talking <laughs> like 30 years yeah yeah 30 Ish. years yeah exactly right. 29 years wow 29 years okay. i've been in a kitchen okay oh, man that makes me feel old as shit man. um yeah and and it's uh you know i've been plant-based for almost 22 so, so that was my uh, second question yeah. so of those 30 years that you've been cooking how many of them have you like really devoted mm-hmm. to the plant-based like cuisine yeah since before yeah. my 21st birthday uh-huh. so and is that almost and so what inspired so. you to go plant-based and do you use plant-based vegan what how do you um, refer I, to yourself a little bit of both it uh-huh. depends who i'm talking with uh, right. if it's in an article or if it's any kind of media it's plant-based because it's accepted more if it's with products it's plant-based but I love to live a vegan lifestyle. I'm an ethical vegan also, you know, um, you know, but you know, that, that I think plant-based, I mean, they've done consumer testing. I mean, you know, you have a product line. I mean, people adopt a product much faster when it's called plant-based rather than vegan, you know? Um, but yeah, so that was, uh, that what really started was I, I was blessed with asthma most of my childhood. And I say blessed with asthma because I'm not sure if I would have discovered Mm plant-based as soon as I did, if I didn't have asthma. So I was on four or five different inhalers throughout my childhood. Uh-huh. And I don't know if you knew that, but, um, you know, and, and I was ready to do anything. And so somebody had mentioned, I heard it somewhere, whether it was a friend of the family or some, something I read. Was it possibly was a doctor? Something along the yeah. way. Somebody, <laughs> no, no, at the time it was, it wasn't a doctor, but it was, yeah. um, the connection between dairy and health and dairy and asthma. And I was like, huh, maybe if I stopped eating dairy products, and within six months, I cut out all dairy products and my asthma was gone. Mm-hmm. And dairy was the first thing I cut out. I still had seafood and things like that. But then I just started to dive a little bit deeper and what it meant and, you know, the ethical side. And so that's when I went vegan. Mm-hmm. So, um, but within a couple months of eliminating all dairy, I was off four inhalers. I used to go to the, I used to go to the hospital on the weekends to breathe, to breathe off a nebulizer. Mm-hmm. In the hospital as a kid, I had probably four or five asthma attacks as a kid mm-hmm. which is the most terrifying thing you could yeah. ever have you know yeah. so not only terrifying for you but for your parents yeah exactly exactly i look back now i have kids and i just i mean my, yeah my little boy sometimes has you know chest things and you know he's yeah. young and we're in austin with a lot of mold but it's scary you know yeah. i mean what i must put my folks through you know at that time yeah so um i don't know how much you know about season one of the plant strong podcast but we're working I'm working with a guy uh, from the Bronx. His name is mm-hmm. Joe Inga. He's a firefighter. Okay. And he reached out to me to help him with his failing health back in January. And so this season, this season one, is all about me marshalling together some of my plant-based superhero mm-hmm. friends mm-hmm. so we can kind of help Joe. And by helping Joe, we help mm-hmm. every Joe and Jane that's yeah. out there yeah. that's starting to try and embrace this this plant-based lifestyle yep. so you know with my, with my father we talked about heart disease yep. right with um uh, my mother we talked about some cooking tips that she has uh the list goes on and on and on but w- so what i'd really like to do with you today is so so many people that are transitioning over they're like oh my god you know a what am i going to eat how mm-hmm. can it possibly be flavorful mm-hmm. i'm going to be missing out on all the you know these animal fats mm-hmm. and the mm-hmm. butter and the dairy mm-hmm. and the creams and all this stuff 
And so, you know, um, my question to you in order to help Joe and everybody else is, uh, what would you say to people that say, the only thing you're going to be eating when you're eating plant-based, like firefighters, Mm -hmm. are twigs and berries and salads. And I mean, life isn't worth living if I have to eat that way. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, I think it's just an excuse. I think that's pure laziness. You know, um, there is, we are, we are at a time right now that is so exciting in the retail space of just like, you know, products that are on the market, you know, I mean, it's easier than ever to adopt a plant-based diet. You can certainly adopt an unhealthy plant-based diet Mm -hmm. very, very easily because there's so much processed food out there. Uh, But in terms of knowledge and know-how and the abundance of vegetables and the abundance of heirloom grains and beans that are on shelves now, I mean, it's just, it's so easy, you know, Mm -hmm. And, and in terms of resources, recipe inspiration, there's courses out there that you can take from the comfort of your home. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I think so if someone is stuck in their way and just, you know, puts their nose up to it or has that excuse, I mean, everybody will use every excuse in the book, as you mm-hmm. know, but mm-hmm. it's just about, you know, not being lazy and looking at the resources that we have out there. So, mm-hmm. well, all right, let's, let's just dive into then some, some techniques and stuff that you use. So what do you think is the most underutilized way to add kind of a depth of flavor to plant-based cooking. So what I would recommend, rather than just taking out the oil and salt and thinking that it needs something at the end of the day, it's looking at every ingredient that's being used in that recipe and asking yourself the question of, how can I bring the most flavor from each ingredient? If I'm not reaching for that bottle of oil or that bottle of salt or that sugar, you want to focus on all the other ingredients. And rather than, if a recipe calls for steamed sweet potatoes in general and you typically had dosed it with olive oil or whatever, now look at that sweet potato and say, how can I get more flavor out of that? And it's roasting, it's caramelization, it's, you know, uh, it's grilling, it's things like that. And so it's, you know, looking at every technique that can take an ingredient to the next level with flavor will give you that end result that's going to give you a better right. overall flavor profile. So like, you know, I, so. I, so like I, one of my tricks, I just love use putting onions, putting mm-hmm. corn off yeah. the cob, yeah. uh, Put on parchment paper uh-huh. and then roasting them in the yeah, onion. Yeah. But so you said when roasting is that your definition of roasting? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Roasting, caramelization through slow slow heat also happens. You know, you can do that with onion. You can do that. so. I also uh, in the book, the Whole Foods Cookbook, which is uh, yeah. definitely check out all in the oil. Um, it is. Uh, we use these. We have this whole section called flavor bombs, uh-huh. which is really important. So we'll basically take onions or take garlic and we will um you know basically you braise them in a little vegetable stock and you know basically covering them in vegetables chop them up put them in a a casserole pan cover them in vegetable stock roast them until they get a little crispy bits on top and then it's most of the liquid has uh has uh uh, evaporated. evaporated and so you get in that caramelization not only from the vegetable stock but it's drying out from the onions and garlic take that you blend it up put it in some ice cube trays, freeze them, pop them out, put them in a Ziploc bag. Every time you're making a soup, oh, wow. drop one in and a sauce into a soup or something like that. So and so like we a, have a, like a little veggie bouillon cube. Yeah, but it's, it's right. just very concentrated. It's a concentrated yeah. onion puree or a concentrated garlic puree. And that doesn't have the salt or oil in it. And you, you're making a soup or a sauce. It just adds it to, takes it to the next level. So this, these are the tips that people yeah. want to hear yeah. that, 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 that's beautiful right there. Yeah, in seeds, toasting seeds, yeah. I mean, just by, if you're going to use, like uh, going back to that, bringing the most flavor out of every ingredient. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if you're working with seeds or nuts, like dry toast them in a pan, it brings out so much more flavor. Like dry, to, like toasted sunflower seeds, I always have them at my house yeah. to sprinkle them on salads, sprinkle them on rice and beans, and it just yeah. adds a totally another level of flavor to them. What so. about, uh, can you do that with like walnuts? Oh yeah, completely. Walnuts, right. I, I love doing seeds. You can do it with the walnuts and then just chop them up afterwards. Or you chop them up so it has a little more surface area to, to toast mm-hmm. um, and mm-hmm. then add those. If you're using spices, same thing. If you uh, if a recipe calls for cumin, yeah. Try toasting the cumin in a, in a pan and then grinding it. So what? And so what does that do? Does it just bring out it the flavor? It brings up the essential oil. So with the toasting process, if you're hitting the surface with heat or with any kind of nut or seed or, or, yeah. or um, um, uh, spice, whole spice, it brings out the essential oils to the surface of that product, right? So it, you're getting a lot more flavor. So, um, you know, you don't, there's no need to roast things in oil. That's why I like, you go into the bulk department or, you know, there's all these roasted cashews or roasted almonds and they're just, there's tons yeah. of oil in them. Yeah. And, you know, with the roasting process, you can dry toast them and it's amazing. Mm-hmm. You don't even need it, you know? Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. so using the, you know, toasted spices though, Rip is, 
is one of my favorite ways to get to get a lot of flavor with you know oh, in yeah. the dishes so and so you, so speaking of spices what would you say are spices that every plant-based cabinet should have in them is there an assortment like a like a essential five or ten yeah i like to have uh i mean it depends on what type of cuisine you like to focus on myself i like either eastern flavors like thai vietnamese those kind of flavors or more mediterranean so it kind of all over the map so so i'll always have like onion granules garlic granules um do you like granules as opposed to powder i do i do and because it has a little bit more flavor powder tends to clump up especially in sauces uh-huh, so if uh-huh. you get granules there's a little bit more distribution and they don't clump which is nice okay. um so onion, onion garlic onion garlic i would do some paprika if you like some smoky flavor you can add smoked paprika which is nice yeah um, um also uh cumin is a good staple um, if I'm going to have... Cumin seems a little divisive. Some people don't like it. Some people do. You yeah. Find and too- if I, I use cumin seed, cumin seed and mustard seed are two of my favorite spices to work with also, um, especially so you, when I'm making soups. So, so you don't get the cumin powder. You get the cumin seed. I get seed, cumin seed and then I grind them. And then, you, the and then you grind them. Yeah. And okay. you can get a mortar and pestle. Which you is are like, a chef. You can, get, <laughs> I can get a, you can get a mortar and pestle or you can get a, just a little spice grind, a little coffee grinder, you know, and grind them yourself. Um you know, but I, I, I mean, mustard seeds are amazing. So if you're doing like, if you're cooking a soup, let's say like yeah. one of my favorite soups is like a lentil, you know, a, just a, a, a split lentil soup. So, um, I like to, when I'm dry sauteing the onions, I'll add some mustard seeds in there. So those get a little bit of toasted, uh, flavor also. And then right when they're right, when the onions are translucent, the mustard seeds I assume are cooked at that point, and then I had the lentils, and I had the coconut milk, and then I had the vegetable stock, and all that, and you kind of build from there. So, soups are a perfect example of building flavor because yeah, yeah. soups are are all about layering flavors, you know, rather than you can certainly take all these ingredients and put them all in one pot, right, and just turn on the heat, right? You can do that, but it's going to have one flat flavor, uh, uh. and this is the whole mindset of a chef: is how do you layer flavors, mm. and so. So you like for a soup. So let's, can example. you can you just walk? Let's let's me and you right now make a what's what did you say your favorite soup was? Was I'd it a, a lentil? Pea? It's a, a lentil coconut soup. It's okay, so good. lentil yeah. coconut soup. We just walk me through that from yep. start yep. start to finish in like yeah. two or three minutes. Yeah, and it's a and it's you can swap out the ingredients for each step, right? So if uh, if I'm saying use onions, you can use shallots, you can use green onions, you can use leeks, right? Right. If I'm saying use mustard seed, you can use cumin seed, you can use coriander seed, things like that. Okay. So you can always swap things out. If I'm saying you split lentils, you can use whole lentils, you can use other beans, you, you know, things okay. like that. So so you always want to look at a category to make the recipe your own, you know? If you always lo- look at a category and be like, you know, I don't like white beans, well then use black beans, use lima beans, you know? Or I don't like onions, well great, use leeks, you know? So mm-hmm. so I'll basically start uh, a heavy bottom pan, so stainless steel pan. It's- so th- that was gonna be one of my questions is what type of pots and pans are you cast iron? Or are you I nonstick? See, I, what do you? What do you? I love cast iron. The, the the problem with a lot of nonstick, there's Teflon and a lot yeah. of nonstick, um, and it's I mean it's just proven to be uh, slightly toxic when you're right. cooking acidic vegetables on there, acidic fruits. Um, I like cast iron, um, but when it comes to pots, like there's a ceramic coated which is good, yeah. um, so you can get cast iron ceramic coated. There's a great company called Lodge in the U.S. Here, yeah. um, it's a ceramic. I mean it's a cast iron company. They have some ceramic coated. You can also get. Uh, La Crusade, which is way overpriced in my opinion. So Lodge is reasonable. Yeah, Lodge is really good for cast iron, especially the enamel coated uh-huh. ones. So how, how much would a, like a typical maybe? Uh, I mean, you can get, I like Lodge for like, they're called Dutch ovens, which yeah. is basically just a, a nice soup pot, like yeah. a casserole, like a, a, a stew pot. How much is that going to cost me? You 50 know? bucks. 50 bucks. 40 bucks. Okay. You know, and uh, they'll last forever. So I've, so I've got my Lodge and I'm getting, getting, ready, lodge. To, so, getting yeah, ready to so, make this, this, yeah. this. So let's this heat it up. Let's turn it up. Soup. Let's turn it up to a medium heat. Okay. You don't want it to go too high because you'll burn things. Yeah, you know? yeah. So turn it to a medium heat. The key to starting every recipe is to make sure that the the pan is hot before you add your onions. Okay. okay. Or before you add any aromatics. So make sure it's hot. And the way that you can do it, just kind of hover your hand over yeah, it, and you yeah. can tell when it's hot when it's not. Obviously, you don't want it smoking, so I always put it on like a medium to high rather than a high. Yeah. 
add the onions to it so, totally dry pan okay and we're not doing any oil zero okay. zero, zero nothing so dry just, onions just to a dry onion. pan and the reason this works though is you add dry onions to a cold pan and then start heating it up they're going to contract at the same time so they're going to stick and they're going to burn uh -huh. okay if you heat up the the pan first the pores of the pan contract so you're adding the onions which are not contract at the same time so it creates almost a non-stick surface you're also a, you're also a physicist yeah <laughs> well, physicist. It's, but it's true though this is how we figured out how to cook yeah. without oil um and so you're, you're stirring those around constantly and what you'll notice on the bottom of the pan is all these little bits and uh, coloration on the pan and what that is is someone will say it's burning but it's not it's basically the the sugars being released from the onions caramelizing that, caramelizing slowly without oil you don't need oil at all so um, if you're going to add spices to that what i'll do is I'll add mustard seeds, as I mentioned, a black so, mustard so seed. So do you do that how long after you add the onion? Onion, stir them around, stir them around for a couple minutes, then okay. add, you know, okay. some mustard seeds in there. Um, uh, I believe this is the recipe in the Whole Foods cookbook. And these, are, and these are mustard seeds that have been grinded, right? No, this is whole. Whole little whole. black mustard seeds. They're teeny little black mustard seeds. Okay, okay. So it's more Indian flavor, right? Okay. So adding those to the onions, okay? Then when normally... Um, if you were to add oil, you add a couple of tablespoons to start off that soup. Uh, but what I use is I use a, a flavorful liquid of the same amount of oil that, that you would use oil, maybe a little bit more. So, um, so once the onions are translucent, you get some speckles on the bottom of the pan. Now you can deglaze it. So deglazing is basically it translates to picking up the sugars. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. So any liquid will do it. So you can hit it with wine. You can hit it with vegetable stock. I tend to avoid water as much as I can with cooking because right. all the vegetables and everything we use have so much water and water has no flavor, right. you know? So try it. You can get plenty of no sodium vegetable stocks out there. Um, um, and so I'll add, uh, I'll add a little bit of vegetable stock and what it does is it deglazes the pan. You'll start stirring up and you'll see all those little speckles mm. are now picked up off and it's clean bottom of the pan. So then what I'll do is I'll use my, uh, red split lentils, um, and then I'll just add those to the pan, all right, while after I add the vegetable stock, stir, now why, stir, stir. Uh, why red lentils as opposed to brown, yellow? Because or they something? melt. A split lentil melts, you know, any kind of dal or a split lentil melts when uh -huh. you cook it. You uh -huh. know, if you're using a, you can use like a black lentil, you can use a green lentil, um, right. and those will keep their shape, which is great. Right. Um, but so the red ones cook the, the red fastest? Ones, the red ones cook the fastest, but they also like melt. So it's almost, it turns into almost just like a creamy soup, Oh, that's nice. You know, which is really yeah. nice. So, um, so add the lentils. And then I'll add some of the more aromatics while I'm stirring that up, still on medium heat. I'll add some ginger to it, okay? You can add some chilies to it at that point. And this is just the lentils and onions in the pan, right? Right. Then you can hit it with vegetable stock or diluted vegetable stock or water if you wish um, until you're just about an inch over the lentils, okay? Stirring it up. These are going to cook pretty fast. Keeping it on a medium heat, you know, um, uh, bring it up to a simmer. And once it's to a simmer, I mean, bread lentils cook, especially even if, if you soak them beforehand, yeah. just like you would any... 10 minutes? Uh, it'll cook maybe 10, 15 minutes. The yeah. soup is done, right? So you're, you, add the, you add the vegetable stock, bring that up to a simmer, stir that around. You can cook it for a few more minutes, yeah. five to eight, eight minutes or so. Um, and then what I like to do is I add some coconut milk, totally yeah. optional, yeah. but you, I add a can of coconut milk to a whole big pot of soup. And that's going to really help with that creaminess. And, and then do you add any other vegetables or is that it? That's it. That, well, I like that's the simplicity well, and then of that. When it's done, yeah. so then I remove it from the heat. Okay, when it's done, you can see yeah. the melt, The lentils are almost melted. That's a good way to describe them as they yeah. melt and they kind yeah. of break apart. Um, that's when it's done. So you remove it from the heat. You can put a lid on it. I'll chop up a bunch of cilantro. Yeah. I will chop up more chili if I want. Um, and then I have lemon juice and I take one lemon mm -hmm. you can zest it if you want in there or you can just squeeze the lemon in. And is that giving you some acid? Yeah, it's the acid. So you're basically building these flavors. I talked about yeah. the importance of building flavors. If you're enjoying the guests on my podcast, come spend the weekend interacting with all of us. Dance with my sister Jane, hike with my mother Anne, share a meal with my father Essie and spend time with all of our dynamic speakers. Doctors Dean and Aisha Shirzai, the authors of The Alzheimer's Solution. Paul DeGelder, the host of Shark Week. Dr. Jim Loomis from the Game Changers documentary. Dr. Cyrus Kambada and Robbie Barbero of Mastering Diabetes. Dr. Sarai Stanzik, as featured in the documentary Code Blue. 
and my buddy, John Mackey, the CEO of Whole Foods Market, and many, many, many more. Pick and choose from a robust variety of talks. Enjoy plentiful, plant-strong buffets, take in the mountain air, and start the day with an invigorating morning dance party. Come celebrate what it means to live plant-strong. On-site accommodations are still available, so join us August 9th through the 11th at our 8th annual Camp Plan Stock. For more information, go to engine2.com and click on events. I look forward to doing tail shots with you. So tell me, tell me like salt, sugar, fat, and acid, how that's how you've incorporated that into the into that Yeah, soup. well, whenever you have something that's really rich, the easiest way to lighten it up is with a little bit of acid. You know, it really brightens the flavor. So acid, especially citrus in yeah. particular, yeah. brightens flavor. Okay, um, so if if you have something rich, this is why like like a traditional like a, a Thai soup called tom kha soup it's a coconut milk soup mm. this is why it has lime in it right because otherwise it's just going to be rich you know if there's a lot of lime in it then it's just like it's like wow this is a really light refreshing soup even though it's rich right yeah. so so that's what lemon and, and other citrus does so at the end of the soup i add the citrus i add the cilantro it's off the heat stir stir serve it you can put some and let me ask you this so for the kind of the hardcore engine to audience mm-hmm. that's out there that uh, is trying to stay away from the saturated coconut, fat that's yep. in coconut. Yep. Can you use a coconut extract with a plant-based milk as a substitute? You don't. Well, you're not or, going at it. You're not using it necessarily for the coconut flavor. You're just using it for the richness. So you can put in half cup of milk at that point. You know, any kind of plant-based milk. Plant-based milk. Oat milk. Oat milk's awesome in it. You right. Know? So right. right. Um, make sure when you whenever you're cooking with the milk in savory dishes totally unsweetened you know and even unsweetened have sweetened them a lot of them um so just make sure that's completely unsweetened because you don't want it at, at all sweet right okay, so okay um but the key is really going back to the the flavor building and the layering of yeah. flavors you know and that fly, final touch is those herbs gives you that burst of freshness the citrus lightens it up and yeah, so yeah. you're thinking about layering and that's what you should consider I, I, whenever you're i'm, whenever you're I'm psyched mission, to make so. that when i get home i seriously <laughs> am so i think one of the things one of the if you want to call it a flavor that pe- people miss is that umami mm-hmm. right for people that don't know what that term is can you explain yeah umami is 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 basically what you can get through you can get through ingredients and you can get through technique. So usually if people are charring and, you know, a lot of meats, they have that umami flavor. It's the iron in that, in that flavor, yeah. right? So um, you can get the same thing, obviously, with plant-based. And so a lot of our focus with food is, is considering the umami flavor. So, so it's um, kind of like a, is it kind of like a... Well, when I when I think of a mummy, it's kind of like a, 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 a meat, like, is like a meaty flavor. It is or? like so mushroom. For an example, yeah. mushrooms, nutritional yeast, uh, soy sauce, like these are umami flavors. Okay. You know, um, um, those are in terms of ingredients. And then you look at you know tofu is umami. If you bake yeah. tofu, that's umami yeah. Yeah. flavor because yeah. you're getting the sort of the a little bit of tamari in there, the little bit portobello of, mushrooms. Yeah, any kind of mushrooms will be umami flavor. Um, and then you can also achieve umami through technique. So, so roasting, caramelization, charring, mm-hmm. um, you know, grilling, a little bit of slight smokiness, like those are also. So a lot of things we talked about to kind of bring up the flavor exactly. profile. Those are also umami. So a lot of people may not know the flavor or what it's called, but right. everybody's right. doing it, you right. know, and, and consuming it and enjoying it, you know. So this is why um, Japanese food, it's mm-hmm. like their main flavor profile is umami. Okay. So you, you know? talked about uh, mushrooms there. Um, I think a lot of people are kind of spooked, mm-hmm. weirded out by mushrooms. Yeah. What's your opinion of mushrooms? Do you use them a lot in your wicked healthy cooking? Yeah, mushrooms, I would say, are the most sustainable food on the planet, without a doubt, without a doubt. So Derek, uh, my brother, um, partner in Wicked Healthy, he's like the mushroom <laughs> mushroom maniac. Mushroom right? man? He's a, he's a mushroom man. So he's basically um, dedicated many, many years to master the art of cooking mushrooms and it's obviously rubbed off on me and and that's how I'm working with them as well. Um, But mushrooms are, you know, I mean, you look at from, you know, from a a flavor, an umami standpoint, a substitution substitution texturally for meat. um, And then you also look at, um, you know, the sustainability aspect. I mean, you get something that's like a, a king oyster mushroom, which is like the long ones with a thick stem, kind of smaller top that we use in like sautés and grilling and things mm-hmm. like that. Those grow from spore to full grown two weeks. Mm. 
That's insane. And that is right. That's a meal. That's right. two weeks. It grows in two weeks. There's nothing else on right. the planet that grows in two weeks. Well, you know, meal. you say that, and I think about my, my backyard. I'll go out for a walk <laughs> yeah, one day, exactly. and there's no mushroom. Yeah. The next day, it's yeah. the size of a grapefruit. I'm like, yeah. how did it's, that grow that fast? It's, cra- it's really crazy. And yeah. it's, yeah, it's the only seed that survives in space, which is totally weird, but random <sighs> back there. Uh. <laughs> it's not wild. So they're not from here. <laughs> um, but anyways, it's, uh, you know, they're... And when we speak of mushrooms, we're not just talking about buttons and, you know, portobellos are great, but... Well, yeah, what are your... What are your... What are your mushroom, go, my what go-to, do you like? I love, like, just clustered oyster mushrooms. Those are pretty common to find. Um, those are in a cluster. Um, mm-hmm. The gray, You can get gray oysters or white oysters. Um, there's also yellow and pink also, um, but gray are the most common. Um, also, king oysters. King oysters, they're also called, like, French horns or orangue mushrooms. Those are the ones, that like I was saying, that have the really thick stem. So if I'm making, like, a scallop, that stem, mm, you just mm. cut it up. I cook it in, like, a kombu stock, like a seaweed broth, and then and then I'll and roast like them or grill them. Killer seafood substitute. It's amazing. It's mm-hmm. the texturally and appearance-wise identical wow, to wow. scallops you know you're infusing it with a little bit of seaweed flavor with the umami stuff with that i call it umami stock but it's seaweed a little bit of soy yeah, sauce water yeah, yeah. um and what about what about white button white button are great it's just a matter of how yeah. you cook them so a lot of people don't like mushrooms and they freak them out because a lot of people were grown up on canned mushrooms yeah okay and canned mushrooms they're obvi- they're slimy yeah. that's what most of these pizzerias use when yeah. they put them on yeah. pizzas and um nasty but like and, and and so if you don't cook them, they're going to be slimy. They absorb liquid. So, um, so the key is to is to press them. Okay, even buttons. I started pressing buttons. What do you mean um, by that term, press? I'm pressing them. So if I, I use like cast iron. So a lot when it comes to mushrooms. This is again Derek's philosophy around mushrooms that he is has completely dominated Wicked Healthy Instagram feed, as you can check out. Uh-huh. Uh, but it, it basically, you get a very hot cast iron. If it's seasoned properly, seasoning it, making sure that it's you know, you do have some oil around your house because you're seasoning your pan yeah. and that's making it so it doesn't rust. And that's yeah. also creating that nonstick surface. You're not using it in cooking, but it's a seasoned pan. Um, so you basically get it nice and hot. You get a smaller saute that's a little bit smaller than your other one. Okay. And so let's say that you're cooking buttons, super, super hot. You put the mushrooms, you slice them, you put them face down, you know, flesh down. Yeah. Um, and then you put the other pan on top. Oh, and then you take press a, them like that. And you press them like that, you know, and it's kind of like, it's like a traditional Almost. dish that they used to do with, it's called brick chicken. They basically pressed it so it condenses the fibers. We're using that same technique with mushrooms, with all mushrooms. So, um, and so you're basically, you're, you're removing the moisture, all right? So you're, even with buttons, you're removing the moisture. I do the same thing. If, I used to just throw portobello on the grill yeah. or marinate it and throw yeah. it on the grill. What I'll do is I'll press it first. So I'll put a cast iron yeah, uh, if you choose to use spray oil, that helps. If not, a seasoned yeah. cast iron is totally fine. Um, you press it, high heat, press it, and then you flip it, press it again. So you're charring both end, both sides, and then you're con- you're condensing the fibers and you're releasing a lot of the moisture in there. Oh, oh. And then after it's pressed, then I'll marinate it. Oh. So you're marinating it, and you're so you're removing the the water. And then would you roast and then it and grill it and then grill, grill it. it? Oh my gosh, so no. good, it's so yeah. good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's super meaty, like a portobello. A portobello, just pressed both sides, marinate it just with a whatever your favorite flavors are mm-hmm. with marinade, mm-hmm. um, and then throw it on a grill, yeah. get those char marks, throw it with some rice and pizza. Yeah. Oh my gosh, like you I can't ask s- for a better. I had somebody uh, once make me a bunch of portobello mushroom uh, jerky mm-hmm. that had mm-hmm. been you know completely yeah. dried out, and then you know with spices, and mm-hmm. I was just blown away yeah, at how crazy. good it was. Crazy, because really, what we're looking at—I mean, this is—you can baconize anything, you know. Yeah, All this yeah. whole bacon rage, which is ridiculous, um, you know. Um, but you know, what, the reason that people are attracted to bacon is because the smoky sweetness, yeah. uh, saltiness of yeah. it. That's it. It's just flavor, you know. So yeah. you can do the same thing with so many different vegetables, you know, eggplants and carrots and tempeh and tofu and mushrooms and yeah. Uh, I once was in Portland with a cousin, and we went on a hunt for some oh, chanterelle oh, nice. m- mushrooms. Nice, you yeah. ever use those? Oh, yeah. yeah, chanterelles are amazing. Chanterelles are amazing. They they look a lot like hedgehogs. I like hedgehogs. <laughs> all hedgehog, hedgehog mushrooms. You're right. Um, and so those are those are fantastic. 
in our book so we when we we uh for the wicked healthy cookbook there's a ton of mushroom recipes in there we talk about the pressing method in there um we uh it was early in the season i remember we did the photo shoot so we did the photo shoot up in oregon and it was like late august and super early for mushroom season but we had a camera person with us and we had our our photography team for the book and so we ended up just saying okay let's just take this day and let's go scavenge mushrooms hopefully we find something and so we go out in the we go out in the mountains super early 6 30 in the morning all misty yeah, in the yeah. oregon mountains so beautiful and we're walking we can't find anything and it's super early we don't even know what we're looking for derek was the the hunt the mushroom hunter so i was kind of following his lead um and a couple other folks that we're with but then we come across this patch and all these all like it, it was crazy like all these mushrooms run into like this canopy of trees and they're they're lobster mushrooms lobster mushrooms when you buy them at a store and they're very seasonal they're they look like like you cut them it looks like a lobster because it's white on the inside and it's red on mm. the outside the skin mm. is red mm. and it's like they, they're these big chunky mushrooms like huge mushrooms and we found almost 25 pounds of mushrooms under this one canopy of my of uh lobster mushrooms which i was blown away so um and it was super early and of course we have this film crew and it was perfect I, I, <laughs> so I, I, those are all captured in the book too those photos so it was by chance that we found them but you poach same thing you poach those in a little bit of seaweed stock and then yeah. you can use those mushrooms it's just you like can, lobster just like lobster you can put them on a grill you can basically chop them up make a you know a egg free mayo and you know do that you know yeah. and put them in a sandwich it's yeah. amazing you know I feel like we could have this whole episode be just on mushrooms <laughs> yeah. but um, one of the things you said so you talked about seasoning that cast iron mm -hmm. uh, pan. Do you then, when you wash it, do you have to be careful about washing it? Like, do you yeah. never wash it with soap? Never, or well, how never, do you do that? So I don't use it. A lot of times, unless it really needs it, I won't use soap with my cast iron. So I'll just use hot water. And it's the same thing with a wok. I have a, a carbon steel wok, which is... Total, it was probably one of the most affordable pans. It would cost like 30 bucks, and it's the one I use the most. Mm -hmm. I have these expensive pans too, but I use my carbon steel wok and my cast iron the most in my kitchen. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, when you properly season, you have to care for cast iron. So whenever I wash it with water, wash, never let it soak in water, right? Um, um, because it'll de-season your pan. It'll remove all those good oils that are in your pan. But I'll basically wash it out uh, when I'm ready to... Uh, it'll sit dirty next to my sink until I'm ready to wash it, okay, yeah. uh, until after dinner or whatever. I wash it out with hot water and making sure you're not using a metal scrubby, okay, um, like a Brillo pad or yep. anything like that. Yep. Uh, just a green scrubby is fine. Wash it out with hot water. Then I put it back on the burner. Put it on the burner, and you make sure you heat it up. Ah. And I, I just put it on the burner, and I heat it up until all the water is evaporated, and then I shut it off, and it just stays in my burner until it's cool enough to put away. Okay. So that's how I keep it seasoned. Okay. And if it looks at even slightly dry, I have spray oil sitting around. I'll spray a little bit of oil, wipe it with a paper towel, yep. wipe it out, and so it just kind of coats it. And you do the back, too. So you lift it up. You do the whole back. You do the whole pan. Why do you do the backside? Because if the um, if it has any moisture still on the bottom, uh -huh. it's going to rust on the bottom of the ah. pan. So you want to keep it complete. So it's wow. a beautiful cast iron is a beautiful sight because it's wow. like shiny black and you know it shouldn't have any rust, or any discoloration, any patina sort of rust on the uh, bottom or anything. I need like to go home and throw out my cast iron pans. <laughs> <laughs> they they all look like the, what you just described there. So. You mentioned the wok. We talked about this cast iron pan. I want to know, so for somebody that's just getting in this lifestyle, what would you say are like the the must-have kitchen, kitchen utensils mm -hmm. to make this lifestyle like easy easy and well and if, if you don't want to go through the problem of the the hassle of seasoning cast iron because it's a commitment and it's just you be, it becomes routine there's also other pans there's a, some non-stick green pans out there this is a company called green pan which is nice um which they use a silica base it's not teflon based non-stick uh so there are healthier versions mm -hmm. of non-stick pans out there so i would this is also very affordable so I would say if you're just getting into cooking, definitely have a cast iron around because they're affordable, 30 bucks a pan, 25 yeah. bucks a pan. But also you can get some nonstick as well. Um, uh, if you have the budget, you can get some stainless steel pans, heavy bottom pans, copper core pans, things like that that are a little bit more fancier, but again, not too affordable. Mm -hmm. So in terms of utensils, 
Appli- utensils, appliances. Yeah, I mean, I uh, high speed blender. You can do m- the majority of everything, and even a, a, a cheap home blender. If you have the budget, go high speed blender, which is like a blend tech or Vitamix that can, you can make soups and sauces yeah. and creams and things like that. Um, uh, and then a food processor, you can pick one of those up and that's where you're going to make your chutneys and your coarse ground, um, you know, pastos and, you know, pâtés and, you know, and things oh like God, that. You're talking a good language uh, right there. Um, and then, so those are the, really the two tabletop pieces of equipment. I like to have, uh, people call it a burr mixer or a stick blender. And it's basically one of those mm-hmm. little blenders on the stick that plug in. And the reason I like that is because if I'm making a soup, I make a lot of like cream soups. So, and when I say cream soups, that's using like a little bit of starchy vegetable in the soup to cream it. You know, I'm not talking about using any kind of cream or any kind of yeah. butter in it. You know, using like beans or using um, even a little bit of rice in there or a little bit of potato in a soup um, uh, or any other starchy vegetable, squashes, carrots, things like mm-hmm. that. They cream really, really nicely. So instead of pouring that pot into Vitamix, which is just totally dangerous mm-hmm. <laughs> when it's hot, right? Mm-hmm. Just get that stick blender and I blend it in the pot. Yeah. I was you know. uh, I was at John John Mackey's for mm-hmm. dinner not too long ago, and he served that corn chowder. From, oh, that's a good one. That, from uh, the, the Whole Foods diet, that yeah. I think that you yeah, guys. Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh, I had fourths. It was <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> that's great. We we, that's we, great. we we ate the whole thing. I mean, that's great. Yeah, yeah. excellent, excellent. Okay, yeah, so a stick blender. Uh, those are really the equipment. Getting yourself a good cutting board. Uh, There's a company called Booz, B-O-O-S, right? They do wooden cutting Mm -hmm. boards, getting a nice wooden cutting board. If you're not doing animal products, you don't have to worry about the cross-contamination piece. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're just using vegetables, right? So I always use a good cutting board, a wooden cutting board. Um, And then a good knife. That is the most important piece of all equipment in the kitchen. What do you you recommend? Um, So a lot of people think you have to go out and spend 200 bucks on a nice knife. All you need is a sharp piece of steel that you're comfortable with holding it and it's sharp and you Mm -hmm. know the basics of knife safety. That is absolutely critical. So, um, you know, you can have all this fancy equipment, but if you don't have a sharp knife, it's it's miserable to cook. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So... um, there's some really simple, like on Ruby or other, you can just basically uh, go on the internet and search short knife classes. And you can just do this in the comfort of your home. I highly recommend everybody doing like a short, like safety and use knife class, which is, you know, an hour class or something online yeah. that you can sit there and practice while you're watching, right? Yeah. Um, because really it's, there's a lot of chopping, as you know, you know, and with going plant-based, you, your, your vegetable consumption increases. And so, so, so does your prep. So what, so does chopping vegetables, I mean, you've been doing this now close to 30 years in the kitchen. Are you like, Oh God, I can't believe I got to cut another bell pepper or is it, or no. to you, is it just like, it's just part of it's cooking. That's what it is. Right. It's cooking. It's just how I consume food, how I feed my family. I yeah. have to chop plenty of things. You right. Know? Right. And, and it's, you've, just, it's natural. It's, and you've probably gotten so good at it that it doesn't take you like no. too much time. No. Right? And I think that's what stresses the process of yeah. cooking is the, the prep that stresses people out. Okay. And there's a couple things that stress people out. I think with cooking is we, we talked about spices. It's looking at the spice aisle and seeing a hundred spices yeah. and totally overwhelming people. Right. So having your basics and knowing the flavors that you like will determine that. Right. And it's a lot of trial and error. A lot of people, the reason that people get so stressed with, with a, an adoption of a different type of diet is it's uncomfortable for them. It's not what they're used to. So what I really like to push uh, clients and, and students is is to just try new things. Like you have to explore new food. You have to explore new tastes, new textures, new flavors, new ingredients. So, because if you you know better than anybody, if you look at the standard American diet, you take out all the processed, take out all the animal products, you're left with about 15 different fruits and vegetables that people consume in their lifetime, right? Yeah, right. And so looking at that and going out and trying something new, trying a new green, trying a new vegetable, trying a new spice, you know, and that's how you know if you like it or not. Next week on Plan Strong, we're going to give you the second part of this interview, and we're going to go even deeper. I want to thank my co-creator of the podcast, Scott Battisill and 10% Media, Lori Kordowich, producer extraordinaire and the Engine 2 director of events, Bumble Media for this podcast production, and Brandon Curtis for everything in between. Thanks to Whole Foods Market for believing in me and giving me a platform for the last 10 years. Special thanks to Joe Inga, our Bronx firefighter, for your courage to 
not only change your life, but also allowing us to share your story along the way. And lastly, I want to thank my father and mother, Dr. Cobble B. Esselstyn Jr. and Diane Kryle Esselstyn, as well as all the Plant Strong pioneers who have been pushing this boulder uphill for more than three decades. As they say, we are standing on the shoulders of giants. And remember, if you're digging the show, please rate us on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. And with that, let me say, peace, engine two, keep it plant strong.